Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to a new world where the quantum computers are coming. Okay, so my name's Alastair Collinson. I work for Zenacord Technologies and blah, blah, blah. You're not really interested in that stuff, are you? The main thing you have to know about me is really I'm a nerd. In fact, I am so much of a nerd that my colleagues call me a nerd. And they are, you know, other computer scientists and mathematicians and physicists. Now, personally, I'm not a physicist, not at all. Uh, last physics class I took is about a decade ago. And yet I'm here today to talk about quantum computers. And that sounds like physics, right? Well, the thing is, yes, it does have to do with physics, but the time is coming where you don't have to be a physicist anymore to work with quantum computers. Being a nerd is totally sufficient. And <laughs> now, we're at a conference here where there's loads of interesting talks, and yet you guys are sitting here in a talk about something you'll probably not need for at least the next couple of years. So I think the chances are pretty good that you too are nerds which is great. Okay, so quantum computers. Let's get started with the easy part. Computers. Everyone knows what a computer is, right? For example, something like this here. Admittedly, this is rather old. This is a replica of the Tsuza Z3, which one could argue was the first computer ever. It was certainly the first electronic programmable and binary computer. Binary being really important here. When we talk about binary, we normally imagine zeros and ones. And yeah, zeros and ones are binary, but binary is not zeros and ones. Binary just means we have two distinct states. Our computers aren't filled with zeros and ones. They're distinct states. And as f for all we care, they could be, I don't know, a green circle and a red triangle. As long as they're distinct, that's fine. Now, most computers nowadays work with transistors, though smaller than these ones here. And the way a transistor works is basically, depending on its input, it either lets a current go through or not, two distinct states. And that's fine, and that works really, really well for loads and loads of problems. But not all problems. So what does it not work well for? Well. Let's look at something we're all familiar with, at least I hope, with nerds in the room, I can't be too sure, nature. And for example, let's say we want to distinguish where in this image we have forest and where we don't. So let's have a closer look. This part here, that's clearly forest, right? And this part here, that's clearly not forest. But what about this area? I mean, there clearly are some trees there, right? Yet most of it is grass. So we have to decide, we have to draw a line somewhere and say, OK, so many trees per, I don't know, square kilometre makes it a forest, and anything below that isn't. That's an arbitrary line we're drawing here. We are artificially making this binary. And it works well for some cases, but as soon as you get loads and loads of these uh, situations where you have to define lines, your, the value of your computation degrades. So how can we solve this? Obviously, I'm going to say quantum computers, because this is a talk about quantum computers. OK, part two of the equation, of course, is the quantum part. I already mentioned physics, particularly quantum physics is relevant here. So quick crash course in quantum physics. Um, quantum physics was first described by two guys in the 1920s, namely Niels Bohr here and Werner Heisenberg. They worked together in Copenhagen and described both the general rules of quantum physics and what came to be known as the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics. Explaining how it works is 
far too uh, complicated to go get into in this kind of session. So I'll give an example of how it works. Say we have an atom. We don't actually care about the whole atom. What we care about is the nucleus. And let's just assume that this atom we have is radioactive, which means at some point it will decay. A small particle will leave the nucleus. In this case, it would be an alpha particle. And what's, what remains is smaller. Now, if you wait for a while, you had it in its original state, you wait for a while, there are two states you could imagine it to be in when you check. Either nothing has changed at all, or it's decayed, right? Two possibilities. According to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, you can have both at the same time. That is until you measure. And at that point, when you measure it, it decides one to be one or the other. Now, don't get me wrong, measurement in this case, I'm, I'm using a human term for it. It's not that a human has to look. Consciousness has nothing to do with this, uh, this part of physics. It's just an easy way to explain it. Measurement can also be anything, any process requiring it to be in one state. So, it's still weird, and we're not the first people to think this is weird. Um, one of the first who was, well, he thought it was weird and he had good reasoning was this guy here, Schrodinger. So Schrodinger came up with a thought experiment which was supposed to ridicule not quantum mechanics, which he thought was correct, but the interpretation that Bohr and Heisenberg had proliferated. And the experiment, as you may have heard of, is Schrodinger's cat. So, assuming you have a cat and you put it in a box. Now, in this box there are some other things. So, there's some kind of radioactive matter. This is pretty much just many, many of the atoms we saw previously. And you selected the specific matter you put in there so that after one hour has passed, the chance that any of it has decayed is 50-50, right? Okay, we have our matter. What else do we have? We have a flask of gaseous cyanide. Cyanide, of course, is uh, rather unpleasant, so it's better to keep it in that flask. And right now it's safe, but there's one final thing in that box, and that's this weird contraption, a Geiger counter which, with a hammer attached. So if the radioactive isotope should decay, what will happen? Dead cat. <laughs> OK, so we discussed this with uh, the atom earlier. If the one hour has passed, there are two states in which we think it could be. So after the hour, we can have either nothing happened, the uh, the radioactive material is fine, the cat is fine, or, well, bye-bye cat. And according to the Copenhagen interpretation, you can have both at the same time. You have a cat that's dead and alive. So, what? Zombie cat? As I said, Schrodinger thought this was, this was rather ridiculous, so he came up with a different interpretation. And actually, if you were in the drop database um, presentation earlier, this might seem familiar, because he mentioned this as well as the multiverse. Schrodinger uh, came up with what many people know as the many worlds theory. Now, physicists are fascinating. They come up with highly complex solutions to weird uh, problems. So what this theory states is, let's take everything there is, you know, the world, the, the galaxy, the universe. Now, I, I couldn't find a picture of the universe, but this will suffice. Um, and in this 
universe, among other things, you have you know, your cat. Now, if one of these quantum events happens, a, a um, situation in which, uh, after which we could measure that the um, radioactive material has decayed or not decayed, rather than getting a zombie cat, what you actually get is two universes, which are exactly the same except for the result of that one quantum event. So in this case, the cat is dead or alive. Now, there, in this case, you do have both states. They're just separated into two different universes. And of course, this can happen again if you have another radioactive event, which gives you even more universes. And again, you get the picture. And I mean, I always split in two. It doesn't necessarily have to be two. It could be some other uh, number of separations. Now, one thing you may notice in this slide is we have rather many dead cats. Come on, there we go. And that's because our world doesn't allow for certain things. For example, if you take a dead cat and add more cyanide, you don't give, get a live cat. That's not how biology works. Luckily, a cat is also not the same as a qubit. And now we're finally getting to the point where quantum mechanics and computing is combined. So what is a qubit? A qubit is basically a quantum computer's analogy to a regular bit. It too can have the value zero, which looks a bit like this. In uh, what This representation, by the way, is called a Bloch sphere. Um, so that's zero. It can have the value one as well. So that's, that's fine. We can handle that. Uh, but it can also have something like this. This is neither zero nor one. It's clearly a point which exists in this sphere. It has a value, and we can work with it. And this value is a combination of zero and one. Now, if you find the maths here confusing, because zero is at the top, one is at the bottom, and something on the sphere is apparently a sum of both, don't let it confuse you. This is a three-dimensional representation of four-dimensional values. Math gets weird. Just trust me that uh, it's a combination of the two. So, OK, assuming we have this, this representation of the state of a qubit, which is what the Bloch sphere does here, we can operate on it. So, like in binary computing, we have operations or gates that we can use on our, uh, our qubits, one of which that's interesting would be the Hadamard gate. So, how does the Hadamard gate operate? The Hadamard gate says, OK, let's assume there's one further axis in that three-dimensional system, which is halfway between the x-axis and the z-axis, and we'll just spin our vector around that axis. What would happen now if we measured the state of this qubit? What would happen if we forced it to take a value of 0 or 1? The answer is it would give us both answers with the same probability, depending on, well, random chance, basically. And so it does have both states at the same time, in a way. This is what's called quantum superposition. And it's a very, very powerful tool in our quantum computing toolbox. Another tool which by itself is rather boring, because we know something very, very similar to it already, is the Pauli x-gate. And the x-gate basically says, OK, I'll take the x-axis and just spin my vector around that. So 0 becomes 1 and vice versa. You could imagine it as a kind of knot around the x-axis. Knot gates, we're all familiar with you know, negation. That's easy enough. The x-gate uh, alone is pretty boring, though necessary, of course. But 
And it gets really interesting when we use the C NOT gate, the conditional NOT gate. So the conditional NOT gate is basically a superpowered Pauli X gate. Assuming you have your first qubit, we'll call it uh, the, um, the control qubit in state zero, and you apply a C naught, then absolutely nothing will happen to our second qubit, which we'll call the target qubit. If we have our, uh, our control qubit in state one and apply our C naught, it will flip. So that's what we saw with the X, the X gate, right? So this looks like it's basically an if equals zero, then X, so, uh, then flip. And for these very simple cases, there's no difference. However, what happens when your control qubit is in superposition? We have two arrows there in the second one. So it's both zero and one suddenly. And it, you could imagine it a bit like this. What's happened is it's in two different universes. It's one, zero or one. And note that um, the control qubit in this case has also changed. Now, this isn't actually what happens, but it's uh, what would happen as soon as you measure it. Because as long as it's in superposition and you don't measure it, it's not forced to decide which am I. So as long as you don't check... Oh, uh, by the way, this is the Schrodinger's cat equivalent in quantum computing. This is what's called quantum entanglement. You'll see that it's either one on both qubits or zero on both qubits. You don't get a zero and a one combined in any way because they are entangled. And um, as long as we don't measure, basically what we have is this. We have two situations at the same time, simultaneous si situations arising from one qubit in superposition. And this is as long as we didn't look. OK, so we've seen a few gates now. We've seen the Hadamard and the CNOT gate. We've seen one of the three Pauli gates, the X gate. The Y and the Z gates operate in very similar fashions. They just spin around the other axes. There are also other gates. For example, the identity gate, which is the most boring of all because it just does nothing. Or there are phase gates, which um, can be written in this way. Um, one project I'll be showing you uh, very soon does use those gates written as such, but those aren't universal definitions, and there are many, many more gates that you can imagine. So, that's what we can do on a very technical level. Why do we want to do it? What can you do with quantum computers? And actually, there are many, many use cases that are coming up, that have been coming up, especially in the last couple of years. For example, one really big one is quantum computers can break encryption in certain cases. Um, or quantum computers can help design cars. Quantum computers can help model, um, uh, model behavior in chemistry and medicine. Quantum computers can help build better AI. Or um, they can uh, be applied to weather forecasting, which seems pretty random at times. Though it, weather forecasts, of course, have gotten better over the last few decades. Um, some companies are trying to apply quantum computing to detect financial fraud. NASA is using quantum computers, very early quantum computers, but they're doing it um, to improve the engineering of well, things NASA engineers, you know, spaceships, satellites, rovers, stuff like that, and to bring a very, uh, a very up-to-date example, it could be used to break Bitcoin. 
So um, those are just a few examples of what you could do, but there's a lot more research to be done here, and that's why we need everyone who's interested in the topic to think about what the possibilities are. Now, okay, this so far has been very theoretical, and theoretical stuff is nice, but you really want to actually, you know, use it in some way. And so I'm going to show you two ways how you can actually use quantum computer programming now. And there are quite a few reasons why you may be interested in doing that. One comes actually from a fellow speaker. Learning something that's just totally different from what you know gives you so many advantages, it makes you think in different ways, which makes you think better. So, okay, let's think differently. And we'll start with the IBM Quantum Experience. So the IBM Quantum Experience is basically a quantum computer in the cloud. Um, IBM built real quantum computers. For example, here's an image. You can see this huge tank there. That's basically a huge freezer in which there's a chip that looks a bit like this one here. And that's the quantum computer. This particular one has seven qubits, which you can see here. And what IBM did is they said, OK, we'll allow anyone to access this quantum computer online. You can program it in an interface that looks like this. It's a graphical editor. You can create your algorithm in this graphical editor, or there is a text-based variant as well. Um, using a language called IBM Quasm2. And you can then run it on one of their real-life quantum computers. At the top there, you see the status of the quantum computers uh, that I had access to at that point. Two, both with five qubits. Uh, for certain members, they also have a 20-qubit computer available. And more are sure to follow. So let's design a quantum algorithm on that. And we'll go with what we've seen already, Schrodinger's cat. So in Schrodinger's cat, in the example, what are the elements we had? Well, we have our radioactive mass. We have the Geiger counter with its attached hammer. We have the cyanide. And of course, we have our cat. And as we learned earlier, these are all entangled. Now, if we move this to the interface we saw previously, it would look something like this. So the uh, this is, by the way, called the quantum composer. And what, uh, what we design is called a quantum score, both obviously inspired by music. And on qubit 3 here, we have our radioactive uh, mass, which, as we learned earlier, is in superposition, so that's done by a Hadamard gate. And the Geiger counter is connected via a C naught, as is the cyanide, as is the cat. And if we want to look in our box, we have to measure, which is represented by this pink gate here. And in fact, let's, um, let's do a bit more. Let's measure all of these gates that uh, we are working on. And if we run this on, again, a real working quantum computer, we get something like this as a result. So this here is the case where nothing happened. Our cat is fine. The uh, radioactive material didn't decay. All is well. This here is the case where, well, things didn't go as well. The cat is dead. And um, by the way, if you're reading the numbers at the bottom, um, Ignore the first digit, because that's the qubit we didn't use. The last digit is the state of the cat. The, f uh, the, second, uh, uh, the second digit is the state of the uh, radioactive material, and I'm sure you can interpolate what the, uh, the bits between it mean. Now, so this is, those two values are fine, but we also have this here. What's this? Well, these are errors. 
The thing is, what IBM built, it is a real quantum computer, but it makes mistakes. And there's a lot they have to do. Um, they call their quantum computer to really close to absolute zero. It's just 0 0.01 something kelvins warm. But they can't get it to absolute zero for, well, physical reasons, you know, that's damn cold. Um, and, <laughs> and so this causes errors to happen. Now, I, I didn't look into why particular errors here happened more commonly than others. It's probably due to the design of the quantum chip and the com combinations on the chip. Um, they do have two different chips available in the, uh, in, in the quantum experience, both with five qubits but with different layouts. Sadly, on the other chip, I couldn't design it because I couldn't get four connected qubits um, on which I could lay out the algorithm. Bit, uh, a bit of a technical detail, but uh, never mind now. We do get these errors anyway, and for this reason, error correction is a really, really important and difficult topic that the quantum computing community is working on. That's the quantum experience. Next uh, way you can get into quantum computing yourselves is the Microsoft Quantum Development Kit. Now, this is much closer to what we know as code from our everyday lives. Of course, pulling stuff, dragging stuff into this graphical editor is also code in a form, but we're not used to that kind of code. We're used to, you know, words, characters, numbers, braces, stuff like that. And um, the Quantum Development Kit allows us to do that. It uh, brings us a language called Q-sharp, the syntax of which, as I assume nobody is surprised by, is inspired by C-sharp. And we'll have a look at that in a, a short uh, moment. Until about two weeks ago, I thought I would have to tell you, sorry, but this only works on Windows. But two weeks ago, Microsoft tweeted out this. It's now available for Linux and Mac. So, great. No matter what kind of system you have, you can run uh, the, uh, the quantum development kit. So, yay! Okay, let's have a look at what this looks like. So, here's a really short example and as you see, I've blurred out most of the code. Um, the part that isn't blurred out is what we'll be looking at right now. And this, again, is our Schrodinger's cat example. So first, we apply our Hadamard gate to the radioactive isotope. Then we apply a C0 to the isotope and the Geiger counter. Then we apply a C0 to the Geiger counter and the cyanide. And then we apply a C0 to the cyanide and the cat exactly the same as we saw in the quantum experience. And now we need some wrapper code, because this isn't enough setup. It doesn't know what these things are. So, okay, what else do we have? Um, oh, we have to, of course, measure. So, first of all, we set up, at the beginning, our cat is alive. And then we say, Let's look into the box and just return, you know, is it alive or dead? Then we do some setup work. So first of all, we say, we need four qubits for this algorithm. And it uses this using block, which you can see at the top, which is specific to Q sharp. Then we say, okay, well, we have an array with four qubits, but we'd like to give them names because, you know, Qubit 2, what's qubit 2? Qubit 2 in this case is the cyanide. So that's easier to, uh, to work with. Proper names are really valuable, as I'm, I hope all of you know. Then we initialize all our qubit bits with zero. Now, we didn't have to do this in the quantum experience because they are automatically initialized with zero. Here, we do have to do it manually. And at the end, we have to clean up after ourselves. So we have to set them back to zero. And this is actually a requirement of this using clause 
every th qubit that leaves it has to be set back to zero. The reason we need both the initialization and the cleanup at the end is basically decay of state. Um, we can't be sure that qubits will remain in zero state. They could decay towards one, or if they're in one, they could decay towards zero. That's part of what happened when we saw these, uh, these errors in the quantum experience result. So this is our algorithm, and we can call this, because we're on the .NET platform, from C Sharp. So this is a tiny block of C Sharp code, and basically we say, okay, we'll use a quantum simulator in this case. Hint, Microsoft right now doesn't offer real quantum computers, they only offer the simulator. The language is prepared to be used on real machines, however. We then run our experiment, get the result, is our cat alive or dead, and then check whether it survived or not. <coughs> okay, so this works fine. We get, uh, um, again, the cat is alive or the cat is dead in 50% approximately of the cases. And you can, uh, uh, you can look into this. There's a lot more you can do with both the IBM Quantum Experience and the Microsoft Quantum Development Kit. I can't cover all of it in this kind of talk. Um, it's just far too much. But read uh, the specs if you're interested. Now, in this case here, we're using a quantum simulator. And why don't we just go that way? Why do we have to build real quantum computers? Why don't we just, you know, Simulate all the things. And I would like to go back to a previous slide for that. Do you remember this slide here? Um, you might... Now, th this should be a really smooth animation. Watch this. That was not a smooth animation, was it? My computer is having real prob uh, problems with PowerPoint. Now, let's assume it has to simulate something a bit more complex, like you know, a huge quantum computer. And you don't actually don't have to imagine this because people have done this. Um, particularly, IBM last year published a paper um, about results from an experiment they did. And the experiment, to simplify it, was they, um, they implemented certain algorithms for quantum computers and optimized the simulation to use a, well, less extreme amount of memory. So what they came up with is for a 49 qubit uh, computer, they managed to get it down to four and a half terabytes of RAM. Down to, um, for a 56 qubit, uh, computer, they actually managed to get it down further. So the structure of the experiment was probably better suited for a 56 qubit computer. Um, what's really extraordinary is how much it needed before the optimization. Eight petabytes or one exabyte. Let me repeat that, one exabyte. Can you imagine an exabyte? An, an exabyte. Let's just go through this. Um, come on, there we go. An exabyte is a thousand petabytes, which is a million terabytes, which, if you speak British English, is a milliard gigabytes. If you speak American English, it's a billion, which turns out to be, you know, 10 to the 18 bytes. 10 to the 18 bytes, that, is, that doesn't tell us anything really. You can't imagine 10 to the 18. Okay, visualize it this way. Our universe, according to current estimates, our universe is you know, 13.7 times 10 to the 9 years old, which works out as 4.32 times 10 to the 17 seconds. That's less than half the bytes in an exabyte. 
So it's pretty extreme. So uh, for the moment, we're probably, for larger applications, stuck to real-life uh, hardware. And this here is pretty cool. This is a quantum computer that IBM built. It has 50 qubits. And I thought this was going to be the largest uh, quantum computer I was going to show you until on Monday, I mean, speaking a few days ago, Google said, hey, we have something here. They call this bristle cone, and it has 72 qubits. What's really extraordinary about this, if it turns out to be correct, and they haven't um, tested it to the full extent yet, but this apparently has a really low error rate. So the problems we had in the quantum experience when we ran our code on a real quantum computer earlier wouldn't occur, at least not uh, in, in that extreme fashion. So um, I don't know whether the term quantum supremacy is something you're familiar with. To quickly explain, quantum supremacy is basically when we can write algorithms for quantum computers that they can solve within reasonable amounts of times, and regular computers, binary computers, can't. Of course, the definition of what is a reasonable amount of time varies. There may be a precise definition of, uh, of quantum supremacy. I'm not aware of it, if there is. But this is a huge step towards quantum supremacy because, I mean, if you need, even with the optimized version, three terabytes of RAM to simulate a quantum computer which has about two-thirds of the qubits this has, things are getting really interesting. Okay, so let's say I've convinced you that this is really something you want to look into. What can you do? Well, one thing you can do is you can register for the quantum experience. It's free. Um, you have no requirements whatsoever. There's nothing you have to do with it. You can just play around. The reason they're offering it for free is basically because they want to learn what people do with quantum computers. They want to spread the knowledge and make sure that as soon as they do offer commercial quantum computers, people actually know how to use them. Of course, you can also download the Microsoft Quantum Development Kit, as I said, now available for both Windows, which is then integrated into Visual Studio, or Mac and Linux, where it's integrated into Visual Studio Code. And I assume most of you are aware of a small site called Stack Overflow. Um, <laughs> there's th they have the whole Stack Exchange network, which includes Stack Overflow and many, many other sites. Currently, in Area 51, which is their, uh, th their area where they suggest new topics and try them out, um, basically their beta area, there's a suggestion for a quantum computing uh, site, which you can commit to. Actually, this screenshot is about a week old. Since then, the number of people who have uh, committed to participate has risen to about 50% of what we need to get started. Um, if uh, you find this topic interesting, why not commit to you know looking into the topic? It's not that much work to do, but show your interest. Show that it's something that you would like to look into. Uh, you can use my personal referral code if you like. Otherwise, just Google it. You'll find it. And um, apart from that, basically, go forth, explore, try it out, and... Thank you for listening. We have time for questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm very new to the topic, but I do understand where the power is coming from. Why the current suppose computer cannot guide, for example, the the sequence like uh, three point and how uh, quantum computers can can what could be done? So like, where is this power? Why? Like, 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, um, where does the power of the quantum computer come from compared to current supercomputers? Why can't we do the same thing with current supercomputers? Um, basically, the answer is, with a current supercomputer, what we would do to, in your example, break Bitcoin is you can optimize a bit, but basically you're going to try every possible variant. You're going to brute force it. That works, but it's expensive. You, know, you need a lot of computing power to, uh, to brute force something like Bitcoin or any kind of encryption. A quantum computer basically does the same kind of thing, except uh, it does it in parallel universes. This is not parallel computing like you're used to. This is parallel as in it operates in different universes at the same time, tries out different things, and then at the end makes sure you're in a universe where it has found the solution. It's a really, really weird concept. And that's because quantum mechanics is really, really weird. But it's... Uh, Basically, you can imagine it, that it ensures that you are in a possible universe, because, I mean, you can't be in an impossible universe. That's physically not possible. Um, and it, therefore, gives you basically a shortcut, ignoring most of the implausible results you could have. Um, the algorithm used to break... Uh, well, the, the algorithm that people are afraid of when they speak about quantum computers breaking uh, any kind of encryption is called Shor's algorithm. And it's uh, been mathematically proven to work um, if your key in represented in binary has n digits, it will manage to crack the code in square root of n, I believe it was, uh, steps while with a regular computer you would need n steps. And now this is a big speed up. It's not the solution to everything. Um, I, and I want to make very clear, quantum computers, I don't think quantum cu computers will replace regular computers because there are some tasks at which quantum computers just suck. If you want to build an adder a simple addition with a quantum computer, you'll get results like, I think it's round about four. And that's not really something we want for something like an adder. It's, quantum computers are great basically for any subject, um, or they can be great for any subject, where nowadays you would probably go uh, towards it with probabilistic algorithms. And breaking... Bitcoin or any other encryption is something that nowadays that is your best choice other than brute forcing it. Does that answer your question? It, it, it is. It's really weird. Oh, uh, one thing I forgot to mention. Both IBM and Microsoft have really great documentation on their websites. Um, uh, there's a, a wonderful getting started guide, for example, on uh, the site of the IBM Quantum Experience. I highly recommend it. They ha actually have two versions. One, uh, a small condensed version, which doesn't go into much detail, and one that's really, really thorough. Um, if you find the topic interesting, maybe just try out the small version for starters, and if uh, that gets you fixed, dive in. Okay, yeah? Okay, so the question is, um, are there problems nowadays that you can solve more quickly with a quantum computer than with a binary computer? And the answer is, not yet. There are problems that have been proven to be solvable with quantum computers uh, faster than with binary computers. 
We don't yet have quantum computers as powerful as we would need to do that, though maybe what Google announced there with Drizzlecone, that might um, change that. It's possible that within the next couple of weeks, we're going to hear we've reached quantum supremacy, which is basically what you described. Maybe not. We'll, we'll see. It, it depends on many, many things. It depends on the precise algorithms that are described. It depends on the error rates and so on and so forth. Um, so maybe it's going to be a week. Maybe it's going to be several years. We don't know. I'm pretty sure it will come within a conceivable time frame. Okay, any other questions? Guess not, then. Thank you for listening, and go explore!